Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here, and today we're going to go all the way over to Poland for a highly disturbing case. In January 2002, an anonymous letter arrived at one of the newspaper offices in the Polish city of Łódź. The article that was published as a result of that letter shocked the entire country. It had uncovered one of the biggest scandals in Polish history. Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario. You're in Poland in the early 90s. Your grandmother is dying, so you call for an ambulance. It arrives and the ambulance crew try to save your grandma, but despite their best efforts, she just doesn't make it. The body can't stay at home and so they advise you on what to do next. A paramedic approaches and says, you know what, there's this good funeral home. They won't cheat you like all the others will. I know what I'm talking about, trust me. Use their services. Here's their business card. Give them a call and they'll sort everything out for you. So, you're probably in shock and you're quite grateful for the help. You make the call. However, little do you know, you've just been manipulated. And as for your grandma, the ambulance crew didn't try to save her. They actually murdered her. Now, to understand this story, you've got to know a little bit about the system changes in Poland in the early 90s. With the fall of the Soviet Union, many countries in the region, including Poland, implemented a series of reforms that led to a transition from socialism to capitalism. The shift was dynamic and generally well received, but it came with a price. A great number of businesses that were previously state-owned went bankrupt almost overnight. And while some places fared better than others, the city of Łódź, with its declining textile industry, was amongst the hardest hit. There was various forms of publicly funded social assistance available, but the money provided by each was quite minimal. However, there was one exception. The funeral grant. During this early transition period in Poland, the funeral industry thrived. However, it faced some challenges. Whilst it is true that eventually everybody will need their services, the burning question remains, how could they effectively reach potential customers? How do you market a funeral service? It's not really the sort of thing that people like to think about. The proactive approach seemed to work best for the funeral industry. Instead of waiting for someone to come to them, they would go out and find people who needed their services. It was only logical, therefore, to reach out to those who knew about deaths first. Firefighters, police officers, and most importantly, the emergency dispatchers and the ambulance crews. Soon a vast network of connections began to grow. When an ambulance crew arrived at the scene of a death, the paramedic would discreetly pass a business card from the funeral home to the grieving family. From that point forward, all it took was a single phone call and the funeral home would handle all the necessary arrangements and they would collect the funeral grant on the family's behalf. In exchange for these referrals, the dispatches and ambulance crews would receive small gifts from the funeral homes as tokens of gratitude. These gifts could include alcohol, warm blankets or even a television set to accommodate the crew room. It shouldn't come as a big surprise that the competition among funeral homes began to grow. After all, it didn't take much know-how to start such a business, and you could acquire most of the materials necessary to run it on credit. Lured by the prospect of an easy-to-run yet extremely profitable business, more and more funeral homes opened their doors. As you can imagine with a situation like this, things started to spiral out of control. Competing funeral homes continuously tried to outbid one another. Information about the deceased quickly acquired a name in the industry. It was referred to as skin. Over the following few years, the prices of skins grew and grew. It got to a point where a successful shift could earn somebody twice their monthly salary or more just from referring the dead to certain funeral homes. This is even though the money had to be split between the dispatcher and the ambulance crew, the driver, the doctor and the paramedic. 
Now, it should be noted that whilst all this was happening, the city was struggling with mass poverty and high unemployment. Under such circumstances, it's easy to imagine that such extra money was desperately needed, causing some moral boundaries to simply vanish. Later, one paramedic would confess everybody took the money. At some point, skins were the only topic discussed among dispatches and ambulance crews. It soon became apparent that there weren't enough natural deaths occurring in the city. Those involved in the business quickly realised that there was only one way to meet the demands of this expanding market. Allegedly, it started with the emergency dispatchers. One of the main culprits was a man named Shredder. He devised a diabolical plan to increase the number of skins. When an emergency call was received, instead of dispatching the closest available ambulance, the dispatcher would send one that had his friends in, or those that knew the business. If the chosen ambulance was far away from the location of the emergency, it was very likely that the person needing help would already be dead by the time they arrived. At that point, all the ambulance crew had to do was pass on the business card and they would make their money. If the ambulance was close to the location, the crew would do everything possible to delay their arrival, making stops along the way for coffee or food. Some individuals had to wait 45 minutes or longer for the ambulance to finally arrive. If it happened that the individual was still alive by the time they got there, they were taken into the ambulance which drove off. It would drive down the streets around a corner and then it would simply stop and wait until the patient had died. The ambulance would then drive back to the patient's home with the paramedics claiming that the patient had passed away on their way to the hospital and again they would pass on the business card of the funeral home. Later on though, to speed up this process and to make sure that their favourite funeral homes were contacted, the ambulance crews offered to call the funeral homes on behalf of the families. Occasionally they didn't even inform the relatives about the call they were making, they just did it. And thus, those responsible for saving lives found themselves in a situation. Letting people die became much more profitable than keeping them alive. Soon the funeral homes began to get involved before people had even passed away. There's at least one documented case where people from the funeral home arrived at an address before the ambulance got there, even though nobody from the family had called them. And there are also multiple instances where calls were made to a funeral home before the patient had even died. One funeral home owner later confessed that the ambulances brought the patients straight to the morgue instead of taking them to the hospital. As a patient lay there dying on the stretcher, the doctor would calmly fill out their death certificates and pass them on to the funeral business. Now, naturally, not everybody in the Wooch emergency services was okay with what was happening. Numerous anonymous letters were sent to the director of the Wooch emergency services. This was a Dr. Lewandowski, but he never took decisive action. When the newspaper article was eventually published, the medical establishment denied any existence of these practices. Lengthy court battles ensued, but local authorities, wealthy funeral business owners and the medical establishment made serious efforts to discredit the journalists who had published the article. Despite the outrage generated by that article, the case was slowly swept under the rug. The public's attention gradually shifted away, slowly it began to fade from the collective consciousness. Still though, there were ongoing investigations and eventually the police got a lucky break. One of the last men to be investigated was an ex-paramedic. This was a man named Andre Norwicki, or as he was better known among his colleagues, Dr. Ibrantil. Ibrantil is a drug that lowers blood pressure. When he was taken in for questioning, to the surprise of everybody, Dr. Ibrantil began to talk. In exchange for the promise of being considered a key witness in the case, which would result in a significantly lighter sentence, 
Dr. Ibrantel, Andre Norwicki, agreed to reveal to the police the horrific details of the practices that he and other members of the ambulance crew were employing to increase their number of skins. He revealed that from the early 90s up until the early 2000s, his ambulance crew didn't go out to help those in need, they just went out to collect skins. One of their main practices involved injecting patients with extremely high doses of various powerful drugs, sometimes with conflicting effects. A wide range of substances were used, including Ibrantil. Another that was commonly used was Pavulon. Pavulon is a drug that's administered to patients during surgery. It induces muscle paralysis and makes it impossible to breathe independently. It has no practical use on an ambulance and should never have been carried on board. And as a side note, until 2009, Pavilon was one of the ingredients in the lethal injection, which was used in the United States for carrying out executions. An investigation revealed that over the course of three years, 1998 to 2001, a few ambulance crews used 843 vials of Pavilon. Dr. Imbrantel confessed that he didn't even remember how many people he'd killed with Pavilon. He just claimed that he'd killed many, more than I have hair on my head. He confessed that they'd chosen mainly the elderly, those aged 80 or older, often those living alone, mostly women, those whose condition was severe but stable. Sometimes, especially during busy shifts, they didn't even bother taking people onto the ambulance, they would just administer the injections at the patient's home. One of the reasons why these particular drugs were used were because they were almost untraceable. With a lack of concrete evidence, it was almost impossible to prove who had been involved in the killings, who had administered the drugs, what exactly was given in what doses. It was simply impossible to determine, and so only four people were actually sentenced, despite obviously many more being involved. Nobody from the funeral business has ever been sentenced either. It seems that the Polish authorities did everything in their power to close this case and make sure it vanished from the public eye. They couldn't afford to have a situation where the population would be afraid to call for an ambulance. There is a lot more to this case, it's a proper rabbit hole and if I went into everything it would make this video a couple of hours long. But I want to leave you with one of the most eerie moments from the trial. The detailed description made by Dr. Ibrantel of what happened to a patient when they were injected with Pavilon. He says, After administering Pavilon, initially, after approximately 30 seconds, there would be a stiffness in the patient's upper and lower limbs. There was an overall restlessness, even attempts to rise from the stretcher. They would try to scream, complaining of severe difficulty breathing this cry for help would effectively turn into a howl. However, quite rapidly the patient would cease making any sound and their body would become limp. It appeared as if they had lost consciousness, as they would no longer move and were unresponsive. From my experience I know that after administering Pavilon, the patient would lose their ability to breathe whilst maintaining their own blood circulation. When there was an opportunity to observe the ECG trace on a monitor, it could be seen that after the administration of Pavilon, the patients had a normal trace, indicating a normal rhythm of the heart. After the cessation of breathing, the cessation of heart activity occurred after a rather extended period, lasting no less than 15 minutes and often longer. In order to not waste time until the actual cessation of the patient's heart activity, I would disconnect the electrodes from the patient, creating a false isoelectric line on the monitor and printout. In this way, based on the false pseudo trace of the heart activity, the doctor would declare the patient's death, even though the patient had not yet died and their heart was still alive and working. And so that's the case of the Wooch Skin Hunters. A pretty disturbing case and one that I hadn't heard of before. I don't know how well it's known outside of Poland, but it seems like the kind of thing that more people should know about. So there you go. 
The kind of disturbing thing that can happen when killing people becomes more profitable than saving them. Anyway, thank you for watching and I hope you found that interesting. Big thank you as always to the patrons who are supporting the channel. Thank you very much to all of you. You really are helping me keep the lights on here, so thank you. If you enjoyed that video, then I've got a lot more on my channel. Check it out if you're interested. Otherwise, I might appear in your recommended in the future. Until next time, goodbye.